Welcome to Season 7 of the Art of Teaching podcast. I'm Matthew Green and I'm so grateful that you joined me today. It's wonderful to know that there are teachers across the globe that are finding our episodes useful. So please take the time to subscribe, share the episodes and leave some feedback. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Darawal speaking people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording. I pay respects to the elders past and present of the Darawal Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people that are listening to this. I hope that you get as much out of our discussion as I did. Please enjoy. Today it's my great pleasure to share this conversation that I recently had with Dr. Nick Jackson. Nick is an educator and former school leader who has a passion for the ways in which technology is used in classrooms. In particular, his PhD focus was on the ways in which students can train teachers to better use technology. We talked about how to create authentic learning communities, schools as circular economies and how we could micro-credential students. I hope that you get as much out of this conversation as I did. Please enjoy. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having a chat to me. Where are you phoning in from? Oh, at the moment, I'm in a hotel room in Melbourne. I'm just here to celebrate my um, graduation from my recently acquired PhD. Normally, I reside in, in Adelaide. Um, and as you can probably hear, I'm not from either of those places. I'm actually from Yorkshire in England, but I've been here 10 years. And um, yeah, so here I am on the, a day of celebration. Nice one. Well, congratulations. A wonderful uh wonderful achievement. Um, I must admit, I love a good Yorkshire tea, good, strong, York, none of this Earl Grey stuff. Uh, it's, uh, do you miss Yorkshire tea? Oh, no, we get it. We get plenty of Yorkshire tea. We, if, we, if we run out over here, we get it. people to bring it over to us or send it over to us because you can't live without it. Although I, did, I do remember back, going back to university and, and actually having the, the, the seed planted in my mind for the first time when I met when one of the lads I went to live with um, as, a, as a student in a shared house, a lad from Brighton turned around to me and said, one of the first times I said, well, you can't, you can't buy anything else but Yorkshire tea. And he went, Yorkshire tea? Where's that ground on the moors? You know, it's not exactly like growing in Yorkshire, is it? So, you know, like why it's Yorkshire tea, I have no idea. But you're right, it's yeah. about the strength, isn't it? When it comes but don't, to it. Can't you just use two or three tea bags or is it different? No, it's not the same. It's stew, wouldn't it? You should know that. Uh, look, I, 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 this is just for those that are not familiar with tea brewing, but, uh, but yeah, look, um, so we've, we've, so drink of choice, Yorkshire tea, uh, or is it coffee or something else? I'm a bit of a flitter and a changer. So sometimes it'll be Yorkshire tea. Sometimes it'll be, um, a good long, uh, long black. And then I've just got it recently got into mushroom coffee. Yeah. Super like strong mushroom that. coffee. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it does um, have the same sort of perk you up effects as coffee, but it doesn't have like the, the sort of, um, you know, pick you up and drop you off, which coffee tends to do when it, when it wears off. Fantastic. Uh, just to let you know, obviously, we're both uh, alumni of the University of Melbourne. Uh, one of my favourite coffee shops is Seven Seeds, so it should just be uh, close. Uh, that's right next to the education building. So if you're there, it's uh, worth, uh, worth a visit. Um, is there an item that's still on your bucket list? Something that you you still want to you still want to get done? Education wise, or just generally in life? Could be. Well, how about we go with an education one, and then we go with a personal one as well? Um, I think I think I still want to um, publish more. I still want to have things recognised as being um, something that people can go, oh, that's his model or that's his theory or, mm. you know, I'm following that course of action. I think anybody who, um, who who does some research work always wants that research to be recognised. So I think 
you know, I think that bit of recognition for, for what you've done and feel like it's actually making an impact in, in educators' lives. So definitely yep. on the, in the education landscape, there's definitely that that I feel that I want to do. Fantastic. And personally? Personally, oh, it's always regarding travel for me. Yeah. Um, travel is has always been my thing. Um, so there's so much of the world I still haven't seen, uh, especially South America. Still mm-hmm. want to spend some time in Argentina, Brazil. Uh, Mr. Pichu, uh, yeah, I still want to dive in some places that I've never dived. So, yeah, there's always travel to do. Can I just say from experience, Machu Picchu was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And my wife and I, pre-kids, uh, we took a, I think it was about a five-day hike. Uh, oh, we, it was phenomenal. Um, we did get the cheap tickets and went during the raining season, so uh, probably avoid that. So I think we were probably <laughs> damp for five days, uh, but it was absolutely uh, life-changing. So highly recommend that. And if you want yeah. to plan a trip, I can uh, let you know a really good tour guide that does that for you. Awesome. Nice. Awesome. And if you could have, uh, just curious, Nick, if you could have a dinner party with anybody, uh, who would be there? I mean, your family doesn't count at the uh, dinner table uh, in terms of seats, but uh, who would you like to be invited? Well, my wife would have to come because she's generally the life and soul of the party and she'd probably get too drunk, so she has to be there anyway. Uh, but I'd, I think Robin Williams would be a really good guest to have because he yeah. come, when it comes down to it, it's a dinner party and you want some life in it, don't you? And Robin Williams would be an excellent guest. Uh, and then I'd have the Dalai Lama. Definitely the Dalai Lama. Um, Muhammad Ali, I think in his okay. prime, that will be, and it's about the mix of people as well, you yeah, see, and I think those people together. Um, Morgan Freeman, I definitely have, just because you could listen to him all night, you know, with, the, with the, that gravel voice. Um, Michelle Obama, I think that would be an interesting guest to put with those people as well. And I think lastly, I think I'd have Blondie, just so she could tell some stories back from the punk days back in New York in, the, in those days as well. And I think in that mix of people, that would be a, quite an interesting dinner party. Interesting. Well, I, uh, I'd love an invite. If you can organise that, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll hit you up for the invite. Um, just interesting, uh, just interested as well. Um, what do you think those that are closest to you would say about you? Um, I think they'd definitely say that I was passionate, a hard worker, um, straight down the line, kind of honest and frank. I'm going to tell people, what I think, uh, but also, you know, uh, a good listener, um, somebody who's concerned with um, how other people are responding to the way I act and the things that I do. But yeah, uh, that general mix of, you know, wanting to get things done, but also wanting to make sure that everybody around me is um, coming along with me. Fantastic. I've always been, I've definitely been labelled as a team player and that's, that's something that I, you know, I, I really champion that idea of bringing people along with me or, or being part of a team, I think is really important to me as well. Yeah, fantastic. And for those people um, that, that aren't aware, um, what's your journey been like to where you are now? I mean, you, you obviously said that you are in Melbourne to celebrate your PhD graduation, but how did you kind of get here? What was your experience like in education? Were there any teachers that made a difference in your life? Um, yeah, how did you get to where yeah. you depends how far you want to go back but i suppose uh, if we if <laughs> we've, got, a, we've got an hour so, uh, <laughs> so yeah yeah i was well let's go back to school i was not the best student at school at all i was very much uh, the bare minimum kind of guy uh, constantly annoying my father who knew that i could do much more it was always that report at school of could do much better you know i generally like to um, act the fool at school and as I say, get away with minimum sort of grades. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in the English system, school system, I stayed on for what's called sixth form, which you do mm-hmm. your A-levels in. So I did them, but I got really bad grades. I got a D and two E's because I spent all my time going to football and going and watching bands uh, all around the country. Um, nice. And Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> and then um, I, um, I decided I wasn't going to university straight away. So I went into the world of work. But uh, that only lasted a year because I saw people around me going off to university and having too much of a good time. So I thought, well, I want a piece of that. So I quit work and went to university. Uh, I managed to um, scrape my way into the, any course that could have me with a D and two E's. And uh, yeah, I got into what was called a combined studies degree, which was law and computing. <laughs> yeah, who knows why? 
anyway. Did you have an interest in any of those? Yeah, I, did. I think I had an interest in law because I used to watch a lot of American sort of crime <laughs> series. So, you know, yeah, Cagney and Lacey had a lot of uh, a lot to answer for, as well as Hill Street Blues and things like that. Yeah. So, so I had an interest in that, and I'd always had an interest in technology of some kind, uh, whether it be playing Manic Miner on a Spectrum or you know, like getting computers to do certain things at a very basic level. Um, so those two things I chose. Yeah. I don't know why, but I did. So I went off to university. Again, I wasn't a very good student at all. I had too much of a good time. Um, and um, I used to DJ a lot when I was there. Uh, so that took up a lot of my time. Also going to gigs, football and various other things. And anyway, I came out of university with um, a pretty low standard degree. I didn't even get honours. I only got a pass degree. So you could say that if we, if we look back and reflect on this, I probably wasn't mature enough for study mm. i was some would argue probably a typical male i really wasn't mature, mature enough to deal with the study or to know where i was going um but yeah i was doing the bare minimum and getting by came out of uni and didn't know what to do um, dj for a couple of years um lived with my friends from uni who all had decent jobs and careers and i didn't have that really and then then things happened in in the music uh, as regards the music and i decided i wanted out of that so I opted to go to America to do uh, Camp America, which I'd done before, but I worked to, believe it or not, washing pots I'd done first time around when I was a student. But this time I, I thought to myself, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to actually be a camp counselor, you know, work with kids. So I need some experience. So I started doing youth work, uh, working in youth clubs, working on the streets with, with uh, kids in my hometown of Leeds. Um, did that various part-time gigs doing um, you know youth work as I say sometimes on the streets sometimes in clubs and found that I actually you know worked really well with young people could relate to them really well um, and went off to do Camp America as a camp counsellor got a job um, in, in for the summer um, or the summer in, in the states anyway or in that was in um, in Pennsylvania Mm -hmm. So I was out in Pennsylvania in a, uh, on a camp there, looking after the oldest boys on the on the and this was a day camp. This were was so they would they did they came for like a week and then went home for the weekend. That's what and some of them just came for the day. So that was uh, an interesting experience. Um, basically, you know, my job was to look after this whole group of interesting characters, uh, and yeah. Spent the whole summer doing that and then toured around America and, uh, yeah, ended up staying there. Uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, met up with somebody and, uh, yeah, ended up staying there, ended up living there for about 18 months. Um, and, yeah, um, worked in bars, worked in a diner and wow. worked in a special needs school as well. So wow. still had that thing of working with young people. It was a principle that, of a special needs school who used to come in the bar that I worked in and said, oh, come and work for me. So I did. So I did a few days a week in the special needs school and it wasn't special needs. Uh, well, it was learning difficulties, but these were kids from, most of the kids were from the streets of DC um, who had been in gangs and then had all sorts of, you know, social, emotional troubles. And yeah, that was quite interesting work as well. Um, again, I found That's that many. I could, yeah, I found I could relate to yeah. young people again. So while I was there in the States, I, I got to, I was getting to that point where I think you get to a stage, most people get to a stage in life where you go, I really need to have a career and do something. So I did. I thought, here we go. I'm going to actually do something. Let's career here. So I did, I decided to become a teacher. So I started inquiring about becoming a teacher. Looked at it in the States, found that it was, yeah, I can't remember why, but there was things that put me off doing it in the States. So I decided to look at it in the UK and come back to the UK. And I came back to the UK. I applied and got on a course in the UK um, to do uh, teacher training. I managed, even with a post standard degree, I managed to convince people that um, I should only do a one-year teacher training course because in the UK, the way it works is, if you're doing it in your own subject, you only do you only do a one year course. If you're doing it in another subject, you do a two year yeah, course. Yeah. 
So I got on a one year course and I suppose this was the light bulb moment. Uh, I was, you know, one, one of the best students they had on the course. So at last I actually knuckled down and studied and worked wow. hard. Yeah. And I found, I found that this was what I wanted to do. I did my yeah. placements in schools, got offered two placements I did. They both offered me jobs. I took one of them and that was it. And I was only a teacher for one term, I think. And then I became assistant head of department after, after one term. Yeah. My first year of teaching. And yeah. And then, and then became head of department the year afterwards. And I've always been in leadership since then. So, I mean, there's, there's so much, Nick, there's so much in that. Like, I mean, and just let me try and unpack that incredible, incredible and diverse journey. Like, do you think that the, your experience at school, and as you said, you were sort of pretty disengaged and sort of, sorry, mm. experience, do you think that has impacted how you were, how you approached teaching and your ability to re- relate to sort of disengaged kids? Or how do you think that's impacted your, I guess, your educational philosophy? Yeah, I do think it makes me able to look at things a little bit differently. It makes me able to focus on the need to uh, light sparks in kids and the need to focus on what kids are passionate about and try and find that thing with kids. It also has enabled me, as you just uh, referred to then, enabled me to talk to kids who on that level and go, look, I know this isn't your thing and I know you're going to struggle with school and I understand that and I was like you as well you know so it does enable me to see that side of things does it make me more able to work with disengaged kids at certain times in my career it depends um mm-hmm. I've found that at different parts of my career I've, I've been excited by different parts of teaching and working with different types of kids so I've worked in really challenging schools but I've also worked in, you know, academic schools. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it depends on the time of, you know, the moments in my career. Really. Interesting. And do you think, like, look, I've, I've heard the quote that things don't make sense looking forward in life. It's really difficult to connect the dots looking forward. But looking back, things kind, kind of come into alignment. Do you feel like that with you? Like looking back, do you go, oh, there was a... Um, th- there seems to be a sort of a common thread here. Like, did you have a plan when you were... A- at your university studying law and technology or no like, no. like- I, i'd say people who i meet who knew me when i was in younger age go you a teacher really there was no plan there was no yeah. plan at all yeah. and um and i think you're right i think reflection is one of the most powerful mm. tools that we have the ability to be able to reflect and the ability to be able to figure things out yeah i think you know i think leading into that a bit of an aside from that i i nearly every day I try to do it every day I do an education thought of the day which I put on Twitter and I put on LinkedIn that's under a hashtag of E-T-O-T-D on on Twitter and um, that's just something that I think of after reflecting after a day at school now it may not be something that's happened in that day at school it may be something that that's been prompted by what somebody said yeah. It could be, it could even be a re, part of a retweet or something mm-hmm. I've read, or it could be something from a few days ago that I've mulled over. But it does go into that, that, that reflection thing. Yeah. You know? Well, we'll make sure that we, I'll make sure I put all of that information in obviously the show notes so people can follow yeah. you and, and see the kind of what you're processing each day, which I think yeah, is really it goes important. Off, it goes off on all sorts of tangents. And sometimes it, 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 it prompts like, that some really complex discussions other times it gets completely ignored and that doesn't really bother me because it's it's my reflection sometimes it's really deep sometimes it's very shallow it's yeah. just something that but yeah it comes down to reflection and i i do think that if we look at some of the the systems in the world that are championed as being the best education systems to me it must be a lot down to the fact that these systems the teachers have a lot of time to reflect yeah when we're, when we're looking at the finished system and all these kinds of things and we're saying oh they've got all this time there must be an awful lot of time to reflect within that mm. system mm. just take me back nick what was that experience like working a term and then being asked to be an assistant head uh, of a department i mean did what do you think there was something that they i mean well they, they must have seen something in you um, to give you that promotion. But what on earth, I mean, talk about imposter syndrome. What on earth were you feeling in that moment? 
I was think it, good, to, was it good that you didn't know what you were doing? Was that a positive thing? Like, I don't know. Like, it seems quite phenomenal. I think the reality is I didn't know what I was doing. You know, right. because, I mean, the thing is, I was 30 years old. I'd got life experience. Yeah. You know, absolutely. there's one thing. The second thing is this was Y2K. So there was oh, nobody yeah. in IT at all who wanted to be in teaching because they were all earning a fortune, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all solving the Y2K bug, which never really existed, but there we go. Um, so to have somebody with the, the qualifications who was going to do IT because IT was compulsory in the national curriculum in, in England at the time was just gold dust. And yeah, I was virtually the only person who knew what they was doing. Um, I was the only, you know, I was a person that, that uh, obviously had a passion for it and was willing to work really hard because in I would say in, in England more than, more than in Australia, you, the expectations around hours, especially in your first few years of teaching, is just, yeah, it's insane. I mean, the pressure's big here, but it's nothing compared to what it is yeah. in, in England. So yeah. and look, I was we'll, willing to do that, you know? Yeah, and we'll definitely touch on that, Nick. Obviously, like, technology is now and so it should be very much at the forefront and the center of education systems as a result of covid and access yeah. to curriculum and so on and so forth there's so much in that and we i promise we'll move into that but i'm just curious about um how you define leadership and also how you think that has changed over the years um what are some of the trends that you've noticed with that I think defining leadership, it always comes down to, I, I really think it's important for somebody to be very clear about what their mantra is, what their message is, you know, what they stand for, and actually keep reinforcing that. I, I think that's really important. I also think it's important that uh, leadership is defined by somebody who does the little things, whether it's, you know, taking time to talk to people, whether it's you're out with the students, whatever it is, that that you feel is important for you as a leader it's the little things and what comes into that is listening listening skills are huge now you i've met leaders who i know they're not listening when i'm talking to and that yeah that's to me that's just not going to (laughs) win that's not going to win me over at all i need somebody who, who listens and can listen well but who also is willing to stand as i said is willing to stand for what they believe in yeah and so sort of, I promise I'm listening. I was just writing down a few things. That, <laughs> uh, but just um, just wondering, Nick, how do, you, how do you build that skill in yourself? Like, have you always been a, a good listener? Is it something that you've had to, to work at? I mean, if you ask my wife, I think I'm a good listener. If you ask my wife, she may have a different point of view. Uh, but uh, how do you, as a leader, how do you embody that yourself? I think um, I, think I did growth. Um, well it was called coaching doing the grow model in in the uk and once i got exposed to that we did a real fast paced two or three days of it when we brought it in as a um, as a replacement for parent teacher interviews in the school i was working for in the uk and when i got exposed to that i really had that chance to stand back and go hang on am i a good listener do i do enough listening do i shut up enough when people are talking Mm -hmm. and i think Again, it comes back to that reflection, doesn't it? If you've got time to reflect on what you are and what skills you bring and do you do enough of these sort of things or do you do too much of that, that gave me a chance to really look at the way I listen and how I listen and the power that's in not saying anything, especially when somebody's trying to sort out their own problems and that sort of counselling situation. So, yeah, that taught me a lot about myself. So I think that was kind of a light bulb moment. So that was... That would be 12, 15 years ago now. So, Nick, is there a, um, a leader that has really made a difference in your life in terms of someone that you've worked with, uh, someone that you've had the privilege of mentoring? Is there someone that, that, that has really made a difference in your life in terms of a leadership? From a leadership oh, well, I think that, oh, that's a tough question because whoever I, whoever I mention, I'm going to leave people out. That's that, you know, yeah, that's, okay. uh, we'll, uh, yeah. we'll be diplomatic on that one and we'll move yeah. on. Maybe. Yeah. I think, I think what I'd say to that is that you take pieces from, from everybody you work with yeah. and, yeah. and not just people you work with. There's people in my network um, who have inspired me in different ways and continue to do that. Mm. Um, so it's yeah. not just leaders, it's the people around you and it's also students as well. So, yeah, you take, I take pieces from, from all sorts of different places, good and bad as well. 
you know yeah. some of the things that that i consider to be bad practice i think you yeah. know teach me things as well well i think it's an interesting point that you raise because i know that i have learned so much from uh leaders that are quote unquote poor leaders um mm-hmm. you learn what not to do uh and uh being an obviously a leader leadership position now it really makes me think about how I come across to others um, mm. it's really I think really important and and Nick I'm, I'm definitely noticing a, a bit of a technology thread uh, in your story whether it be from your undergraduate doing law and technology to uh, your role uh, during Y2K implementing technologies an assistant head then a head um, but also your your PhD um, really looked explicitly at technology what were some of your findings in your PhD and uh are there any, uh, what sort of question did you answer in that? Well, the focus of my PhD was really about um, empowering students with technology, training them up, and then putting them in the role where they're training teachers, but not just training them with the technology, actually training them as regards professional learning, really, not training, in respect of uh, pedagogical approaches with teaching with technology so the whole idea of how you integrate technology into your practice Mm. so the question was regarding um how can uh the student digital leaders uh influence the knowledge and practice of teachers that they're working with when integrating technology so it was wow yeah there is so much in that (laughs) and yeah it the way that the way that PhD research uh, morphs and the way it goes off on tangents and and the way that the question shapes and all that kind of thing, you know, it, it didn't start out with that question at all, but it always started out with the same theme, which was to do with this whole idea of young people being in positions where they can somehow influence teachers and what does that look like? How does that work? What's going to happen? Wow. You know, so it was all in that area, which is, of course, is about power. Yeah. And it's about empowerment and it's wow. about, you know, teachers' confidence and it's about teachers' skill levels. But it's also about context as well, because wow. it depends on the school you work in. So so many factors. Yes. Wow. And I think that's so interesting because uh, I know definitely in my schooling, the the view was that it was a top-down approach in the classrooms where the teachers were the holders of these, this knowledge and it was about you sitting down, shutting up, sitting in rows and your brains being filled with everything that I know as the educator. Do you think that sort of that notion is changing and what are some of the, uh, the ways that I, I guess technology is helping us to sort of flatten that hierarchy in the classroom? I think definitely. I think I don't think this sort of question that I'm asking now would have would have been something in the minds of, of a lot of educators uh, maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. Although there are some educators looking back in history who've done this kind of thing. Uh, but there's no doubt at all that the there is more of a concern and more of, uh, let's say, it's not a trend. There is more interest in the empowerment of students in the acknowledgement that teachers are not the holders of knowledge in a classroom at all. And we can challenge that idea, especially when it comes down to technology. And when we look at recent um, events worldwide, they've definitely had an impact on, on our ability to be able to, to teach differently, to educate differently, to see our roles more as facilitators, to trust students, to, um, to actually do things that we're going to put in place and to understand that we don't have to sit kids in rows and dictate to them what's going to happen. Yeah. So what do you think then some of the implications are for the way that we train teachers? Because it seems like a completely different a landscape to when I was at school. I know, like, even when I was studying at university, which is 15 years ago, I think about some of those skills that we learned that are just not needed anymore so uh, I mean would you mind maybe sharing just for a few moments on what that means for how we train teachers now yeah it's an area that I've I've commented on a few times and um, I when I speak to pre-service teachers that um, I come into contact with either that either the ones I mentor or ones that I've met that are on courses I get the feeling that there's still a lot of work to be done in in a lot of those courses to change things to actually get uh, some 
notion of what is educational technology, how should it be used, the integration mm. of technology, what is contemporary teaching look like, even looking at different pedagogical models, you know, if we're looking at project-based learning versus direct instruction, I mean, how many pre-service teachers consider those, those big questions? You know, how many pre-service teachers understand what the difference between facilitating and teaching? You know, how do you guide young people through uh, building a portfolio, for instance? How do you get, the, how do you manage a classroom full of kids if they're all going to do different passion projects? Mm. Things like that. Is that something that happens in pre-service teaching? I'm not sure that it does. So if we look at contemporary teaching and contemporary practice, and we're talking about changes that people argue should happen, uh, pre-service teachers coming through with those skills? Hmm, I would mm. question that sometimes. Yeah, interesting. And so what were some of your findings of your <clears throat> PhD and did it, um, did it turn out the way you thought it would uh, those seven, eight years ago? In some respects, yes. In a lot of respects, no. Um, I think when you do a PhD, you, as my supervisors told me, um, definitely in the last few years, they kept saying, you know, this is actually, uh, you're an apprentice and you're learning your way through this process. That's what happens in a PhD. So I don't think there's any way it can turn out exactly the way you intend because you really don't understand what it means to, to graduate through the levels of a PhD, which is effectively what happens. Mm. But as regards the, the findings, no, there were certainly things that, that I didn't think I would be discussing or considering. Um there were also some little side issues as well that that I I did I never I never saw coming from the beginning. You know things about team teaching, the dynamics of team teaching when you know two teachers teach together in a pair. Does, um, you know does it does it affect um, the way that they approach it? Do they approach it as a team, and what does that actually mean? Does one take on one role and one take on another? Is that what typically happens with the team teaching? You know, I think some of the ideas to what team teaching is, is different to what we think it is. Yeah, you know? yeah, really interesting. I mean, you throw in a global pandemic as well. That's got to sort of put a spanner in the works. And, and, and I feel like um, I know the conversations that, that I'm having at school is the, the sort of effective use of technology now and that ability to um, those issues around accessibility and um, uh, uh, differentiation using technology are all of a sudden at the forefront of discussions that we're having. And so I kind of think in many ways that the COVID-19 pandemic has um, kind of catalyzed a lot of these discussions around technology. Do you, do you feel the same? I mean, you obviously couldn't have foreseen such an event happening eight years ago. No. Yeah. No, I, I, I know what you mean about those discussions, but I think in a way what surprises me is we've actually seemed to have gone back very much to the way we were before in the way mm. we, we're in schools. We, yeah. I would say in a lot of ways we're, we've largely gone back to how it was before. We, so we had all these changes when we taught online, but how many schools can say that it, they, it has significantly impacted the way that they actually approach teaching mm. and learning? I'm not sure that it's made a great difference. Yeah, as regards considerations of access to technology, as regards that understanding that people have to have a certain skill levels and be able to use certain tools and be in certain competences. But really, when it comes to pedagogical approaches, has it made any difference at all? I'm not sure it has. I'm, obviously, there's going to be some cases that it has, but generally across the board, yeah, I get the feeling that we're back to where we were largely. Interesting. And um, that was another question I was going to ask, uh, and you've kind of answered it. Um, so do you think, I mean, look, we are all creatures of habit. Do you think education systems are, are the same? Do you think we will spring back to uh, previously held notions of, uh, of schooling, or are you confident that we can learn uh, from some of these lessons? I think we have to change. I yeah. think there's no doubt all, you know, the current thing I've been, uh, that's been concerning me and I've been um, involved in discussions and looking at data that's out there is if we look at the workplace as being a flexible environment, which it is for most people now, especially if you're looking at office workers, those kinds of environments. I mean, being here in Melbourne, the city is not the same as it was pre-pandemic. Mm. You know, it, this is Monday morning in the city and it's not as busy as it should be because 
the majority of people don't come into the office to work. Yeah. So if that's the case, um, is there a you know is there a demand there for more flexible schooling, especially yeah. when we look at senior years? Yeah. And, and if we look at universities, recently I was uh, talking to uh, an academic at Adelaide Adelaide University, and she was saying. I said, uh, uh, the students come back for lectures after the pandemic. And she said, no. And she said, the worrying thing is they don't come for tutes either anymore. So if we start to look at that as a dynamic and we say we're preparing our students for life after school, especially in their senior years, if we're preparing them for university or for a working life, which is far more flexible and doesn't involve that 100% attendance or involves more flexible working hours if we're not providing that in schools are we preparing them it's an interesting question isn't it Mm. yeah really really interesting (laughs) and and, and this may seem like a bit of an aside but i remember many years ago having a conversation with a librarian in the school that i worked um at and we're talking about if we should um if we should throw out the encyclopedia britannicas Um, and so i remember those like they used to be a a source of pride on my at granddad's wall back in England, um, if you had a whole set, you were, you know, you'd made it, you know, and they were yeah. working class families and were so proud of having this set of knowledge and then sort of go forward to 20 years, I was having a conversation, like I said, with a librarian, do we need to throw them out? And it raised a really inter- interesting question, which I think has some implications for schooling is um, firstly, like what was in that case, what was the role or what is the role of libraries now in terms of, Uh, being these knowledge centres and holders of understanding and also to sort of um, broaden that further like what is and I'd love your thoughts on this like what is the purpose now of schools why are they there like why do we need them and um, how do we even begin to have those conversations around um, around these new concepts now it's a really it's a they're really difficult Um, are teachers holders of knowledge are they more facilitators, uh, yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think the point is, is as you're raising there, is they are very difficult and complex conversations. These, and they're not going to be answered by me and you on a podcast or exactly. somebody and somebody in a keynote speech either. And I think that's the problem. Sometimes people go, "Oh, this person said this in a keynote speech. We all have to hang on the, those coattails." No, they are very complex and contextual conversations because yeah. one school is not going to be the same as another. Exactly. A university is not the same as a school. So the important thing is the the conversations have to happen. And to me, that there is what's not happening enough. Now, it is happening in some places, and there are some schools attempting to address all sorts of situations. But I would, I would have expected, I think I would have expected more coming out of the pandemic because we had disruption. We adjusted in some ways, some amazing ways. You saw young people adjust to things and some people struggled. We saw some people flourish during this time, being able to work flexibly. We saw other people struggle with lack of socialization. The access to technology was an issue for some people and not from others. So it really depends on where you're talking about, who you're talking about, what's the belief in the system going forward, what type of school is it, what type of learning institute is it, um, how is it going to meet the needs of the young people. And that discussion has to happen at all levels and it has to involve young people. Yeah. yeah. So the, the important thing is to have the discussions and keep having the discussions and pilot things and work things out. Try things. Let's try things and see if it can work better. Is it going to work better for people to have, I don't know, one day off a week or have different opportunities to build their own timetable within the school? Is that going to work? You know, perhaps it, that can't work. I don't know. Is it should a school to be open until nine o'clock at night because that's what people want? I don't, you know what? Yeah. What is what is the right model? It depends. But what a fascinating time to be around. I think because we are sort yeah. of like I know the the, the pandemic has been uh, so disruptive and so tragic for so many people, but it's also caused us to ask some fundamental questions. Like I I remember thinking my job would never ever ever go online, and a week later, I'm <laughs> teaching kids online and while that didn't why that didn't stay it does raise some really interesting and foundational questions about the role of schools the role of teachers how we differentiate um curriculum using technology issues of access like i just remember thinking 
oh my gosh, this is amazing because I get to ask these questions that I never would have been able to ask before. And I, and I love that there's a few people that are thrown into turmoil with that uh, because yeah. it's causing them to, to answer some of those things that they were thought thought were unquestionable. Um, Nick, I did just want to ask, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, when we were corresponding before that um, one of your interests is thinking about schools as, mo- as more circular economies. Yeah. I was just wondering what that means and why is that a particular focus for you? I think it always, it's always confused me in schools as to why schools spend a fortune on certain things when they don't get their students to. And back, we're back to this empowerment of students. You know, mm. let's think of PD for the start of. I've just shown through my research that you can train some students to become experts with technology. You can put them in the role of teaching their peers and teaching primary school students in the use of this, these tools, you know, whichever tools you're putting in front of them, they become specialists in that. Then they get a chance to consider how they teach their kids, in other words, their pedagogical approach. And then you can run PD sessions, which are both the training of software and then pedagogical discussion sessions, which are did with these teachers where they had open discussions about how to approach teaching and learning with the technology. How much would that have cost to go out to a, a company to do that? There's a prime example of a circular economy. But it mm-hmm. doesn't just stop there. It, stops, it comes back to the physical things. I often go, hang on, we're teaching kids um, home economics, cooking, whatever you're going to call it. And then you're paying for catering, you know? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. Surely you put these people in a situation. And yes, it does happen in school. But does it happen enough? You know, do we get the kids to, we, we go out and buy benches you know can't they be made surely in you know in the in whatever design and technology class can't some of these things i mean it may not be all things and it may not come up to standard but at least let's have a go at getting young people more involved in their own community i think it comes back to for me really when i worked yeah. yeah it comes back to that thing in i worked in a school in the uk and at the same time i'd read about a similar thing in japan and in my school in the UK, the year 12s were employed as the cleaners. So after school, they cleaned the school. They were all paid. But believe you me, if there were young people, the younger kids didn't make a mess in the toilets if the year 12s saw anything about it, because the year 12s had to clear that mess up. And, wow. that, and at the same time, I'd read about the, uh, I think it was the Japan World Cup, where they, they stayed behind and cleaned up in the stadiums afterwards. And I just thought, yeah. This but is then, exactly how it should be. I remember showing my students a, a, a bit of a documentary about uh, Japanese students cleaning their classrooms at the end of each day. Yeah. And it made me really think about, like, like that would really build a sense of ownership. Exactly. Like, it, it would. And that, that idea of, like, this is our space. I mean, one of the most significant things I think I have done in my classroom is actually getting my kids not every term, uh, but quite often to design their own learning space. Because I want them to walk in and go, this is my space. This is how I need to function to learn. And that sense of empowerment. I mean, we don't have trashed classrooms. I mean, stuff gets broken. You know, there's 30 kids. I get that. But I do think, like, like seeing students take ownership for that space is so important. And that, that interesting thing that you said about, Toilets are always a contentious issue in schools. They're always getting trashed. There's always toilet paper thrown on the walls. But if you know that, if you're going to be cleaning that up, you would just take yeah. care of it, you know? And I think exactly. that's a really, a, a really interesting idea and that, that, that whole concept of circular economies. I'd never thought about it until yeah, we'd corresponded. But it, it's really, really interesting. And the implications there are huge, aren't they? And there's also a, another arm to this as well. Um, I, I pose the question constantly of how many things go on in schools that are hidden from students that mm. in themselves become a learning experience. Yeah. So you're building a new website for your school. How many times does that not involve the students? I'm not saying they have to have a say in the way it looks, but why are they not sitting in the process to understand how a website is built, how it involves a whole design thinking process, how it involves communication which parties are involved why did things end up being left out why did things end up being um, on the website what what are the regulations what structures are working how many meetings is this involved that there is an eye-opener in itself and just think of that on a different level from a sign that's put out out the front from 
decisions to build a building like it is, you know, all those sort of things. How many of those are learning experiences for young people? And there's also no way, I mean, sort of taking this further, there's no reason why we can't credential students and have some sort of a micro certification yeah. around web design or construction. Or, yeah. And I think really aligning um, these skills with, it doesn't have to be a formal qualification, but it does at least make it a lot more, a lot more practical. I mean, I was having a, a conversation with a, a, a hero of mine who was actually the first guest on the podcast about 18 months ago, a guy called Richard Gerver um, from mm -hmm. the UK. And he was talking about how he, um, they used to create markets within their schools where students design products, where they sell them, mm -hmm. where they promote them, where they, he created a little self-sustaining city in his school. And that's such yeah. a, a simple, but such a profound way of taking our learning and then putting a practical application to it. And I think that is so important. I, mean, I think, um, yeah, there's so, much, there's so much in that. And that's a podcast episode for a, a whole other <laughs> day, how we actual, actually credential students. But I know in New South Wales, we have the TAFE system where students in high school can go and do elect, uh, electives over in TAFE. But why can't we credential and why can't we, we build those capacities within schools? Because... Um, we have the resources there. We're just outsourcing it to private companies. <laughs> and it comes back to that word of authenticity, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Nick, there's so many, so many questions I have. I mean, your um, research sounds, uh, sounds really fascinating. I don't know if you're willing to share your uh, PhD with me, but I'd love to give it a read. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't want to read uh, the uh, over 100,000 words, but you can read the abstract. I'm sure that'd be enough. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Look, it's, it sounds really, really interesting. And um, I think just in closing, like I said, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you're celebrating today, um, uh, but um, are you, we talked a little bit about this, but are you optimistic in the direction that schools are headed? Do you think we can do you think these discussions will lead to sustained change or do you think it may be a bit messy for a few more years to come? I think it's going to be messy. Yes, I'm optimistic that we're having these discussions and I think more people are having these discussions. I'm just always impatient. You know, I, I think to myself, why isn't it happening faster? Why aren't more people having the discussions? And yes, I do understand that there is fear of change and I do understand that it is more complex than perhaps uh, I'm suggesting, but it comes down to having those discussions. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm, I'm optimistic in terms of the amount of people having the discussions and the different ways these are happening. And I can mm. see that people are starting to try things. As I say, it just comes down to impatience for me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope um, I'm also really impatient too. Um, <laughs> I hope that these obviously discussions lead somewhere because it's really important. I'm, I, I know my, my daughter's starting kindergarten next year. And so these discussions have always been important to me, but have just become that little bit more personal, I think, um, mm. because I wonder about the world that she's going to inherit when uh, she leaves school in 18 years from now. Um, oh. Was that 2040, uh, which is terrifying. Wow. Um, and I think about the, the, the different landscape. Um, I was having a conversation with her yesterday. Um, she found my driver's license and she says, daddy, can I have one of these? And I said, you can, but I mean, the reality is, is that she may never have to learn to drive. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah. And like, she may never need one. And so that really made me think, like, what is the world that our kids, um, what is the world going to be like that our kids are coming into? And I think these discussions that you're having and the research that you're doing around technology is um, is incredibly important. And so I, I commend you for asking those questions. I think it's really, really wonderful. And um, just in closing, Nick, um, what currently has your attention professionally? What, what, are you, what problems are you, are, are you trying to solve? Is there something that you're, you're trying to get answers to? And from a technology perspective, uh, I would say I've got a big interest in the, uh, at the moment in two areas, in immersive technology, VR and AR, but I mean, they're hardly new. I just think that's, there's yeah. a lot more research needs to go into, into the impact that that can have. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've also got a real fascination at the moment with artificial intelligence. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, if you look at some of the work that a guy called Mike Sharples is doing out of the UK, he's from Open University in the UK. He's just published a book recently on it. But um, the his book and um, there's a good video he 
a short video on YouTube where he, he really encapsulates those questions. Now, the focus on AI at the moment is really about, you know, how, how can it improve systems? How can it uh, impact learning in respect of going, uh, if a kid's journey is through learning and he or she shows that they're not very good at this, then AI can read into this and adjust mm. the learning sequence or development sequence for them. But he's, he's looking at AI in another respect. He's looking at the scariest parts of AI in respect of teaching and learning. So he's focusing right, right on the idea of going, let's admit that AI can write your essay for you and can write your research paper for you. So if that's the case, what positives can we take from that? What can we actually do as regards teachers and what can we do with learners to actually use the AI as a tool for learning. Wow. And that is just mind-blowing stuff because the reality is, and they will, there are students in up and down the country, around the world at the moment, who are submitting AI pieces of work and they're passing them off as their own. So it's happening now. If you train the AI correctly, I've got it, I've got it myself. I'm doing it myself. I know it works. I put my own PhD question into there before it had been published. And it published an abstract that encapsulated my work. Now that's quite scary. It's, you know, unique piece of work. It works. So, if this is happening right now, you know, the whole idea of plagiarism goes out the window because these are all unique p- pieces of work. So that's the scary yeah. side. But how do we encapsulate this? How do we use this? And he he's come up with some really interesting ideas as to how we use it. And I think this is just the beginning. So if we're going to start admitting that this exists and we're going to start thinking that there's no way we can hide this, then let's, you know, let's see what we can actually do with it. Fantastic. Yeah. Super interesting. And um, Nick, just imagine uh, we're sitting down having a coffee uh, and I'm considering I'm just about to step into my first classroom. What advice, uh, what advice would you give me? Just remember it's a stage go on there and put on the best stack you can. Yeah. Thank it's you. your classroom, close the door, you're on the stage. Fantastic. That's great advice. And final question, uh, Nick, where can people find out more about you and follow some of the work that you're doing? So I am at Largerama at Twitter. That's L-A-R-G-E-R-A-M-A, if you can understand my accent. Um, I'll put a link me. to that, don't worry. <laughs> you also find me on LinkedIn as well. That's two, space, two spaces I really play in. Um, yeah, um, I'll provide you with a link to my PhD if you want to suffer that reading. And yeah, apart from that, you'll find me um, You'll find me at home watching most uh, Legion United games or every Legion United game, but that will be just sat on my own couch. <laughs> I know my, uh, my local team, Nottingham Forest, is in the Premier League this year. Uh, yes. So it's been it's been a long time, but they're back. I think they're still bottom of the table, but they're back at least. Yeah. Look, uh, Nick, a huge um, a huge uh, pleasure speaking to you. Privilege, um, and uh, thank you for the really important work that you're doing uh, in this uh, really exciting space. And uh, congratulations again uh, on the PhD. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Art of Teaching podcast today. I hope that you, like me, got some valuable insights out of our discussions. For show notes, please visit theartofteachingpodcast.com. And I've also created a private Facebook group where we can can continue the discussion there. The link will be in the show notes. Thanks again for listening and can't wait to see you for next week's episode.